Welcome to the Polymer Science Podcast. I am Dr. Alicia Buertes. And I'm Jacob Shackman. In this podcast, we'll be speaking to researchers from around the world and talk to them about how their work is improving our daily lives. I hope you enjoy our conversation and that you learn something new. or good morning that side How are oh you? yes I'm, I'm really good <laughs> so good to see you oh thank you so much for like standing off time on a friday night for me i really appreciate it so much <laughs> uh, you are welcome i was like oh my god it's friday <laughs> i was from the lab and i'm like oh Okay, I will do this thing. <laughs> You're the best. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it's a bit difficult at the moment because we have um, a holiday yesterday, Thanksgiving, and today as well. So the baby is running around circles there outside. So I hope that the sound and everything will be okay. I'm currently like in the bathroom and <laughs> just trying to escape. Yeah, but I can hear you clearly. That's, uh, okay. Where in, in, in US are you based? We are in Wisconsin, Madison. So I, I'm working wow. at the UW, uh, the University of Wisconsin at the moment. We moved very wow. recently, um, the end of January this year. So yes, yeah, all fresh, very, very new. <laughs> But how do you find the environment, the place? Oh, my goodness. It's so cool. The people are so friendly. And it's a very family-orientated environment. I feel Madison especially. So, yeah, it's been it's been a blast. Like, I don't know, you you work at Durban uh, University right now. Um, yes, I'm at the, Durban your... University of Technology. But yeah. uh, I'm based in Pretoria. I'm oh, doing I some. I moved to Pretoria to do some research work. Okay. Yeah. So it's like, you know, that working in a university environment, it's there's like a bit of a bubble, you know, it's a very like a nice comfort to students and everything just makes the place nice. So yeah, it's the same with UW as well. Very nice environment to work in. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's lovely. Yeah. Uh, so yes, thank you so much, Dr. Mapula, uh, for joining me on the Polymer Science Podcast. Uh, firstly, can I just ask you to introduce yourself to our listeners so they can know more about you? Okay, thank you, Alicia, and to our uh, listener, I'm um, Dr. Mapula, as mentioned by you, I'm Dr. Mapula Rosnani. Um, I just turned 40 in September, um, coming from a rural village in South Africa, in um, the north of South Africa, Limpopo province, in Wembe district. That's where I attend my primary school. And then I went to my high school there. Then I go to University of Venda, where I did my Bachelor of Science. I did my honors in biochemistry. Then I moved to Pretoria. Uh, and then I do my MTech, which is equivalent to master's in uh, biomedical technology, and also my DTech until now at the moment where I am at Deben University of Technology, where I'm doing my postdoctoral research fellow. Yeah, awesome. that's basically in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Um, so you're what are you currently working on? So currently, I have two projects that I'm running. Uh, the first project is the one that made me won the L'Oreal UNESCO for South African Young Talent, which is where I'm making, I believe, like the future of uh, a band won't depend on medicinal plants, hydrocolite bandage. And then the other project that I'm working on is we make a scarf, plant-based scaffold for tissue engineering and regenerative medicine of cartilage and bone defect. So wow. it's two projects, but yeah. That's great. That's actually the two things that I would love to talk to you about today. Um, but yeah, you you mentioned mentioned the L'Oreal UNESCO Prize, and I'm I'm just I, I I'm really impressed with that. And I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that as well, uh, just at the end of our episode. Um, but let's first jump into like the interesting publications that you have, um, specifically focusing on cartilage and cartilage regeneration. Um, could you tell me a bit more about this study and what you were researching exactly and you know what the study was about? So uh, the, the study was just uh, a, is a book chapter which uh, it was uh, basically happened during my, when I was doing my PhD and we were working in a group. It was not a, an individual work. And then what we do, because in our research lab, we started looking at uh, medicinal plants, uh, South African uh, native flora that are used by traditional healer for when a person is having like arthritis, when a person is having joint pain. Then we start now 
taking those plants, we start screening them. Then that's when the study come up. And then we look on the study, we look at the plants called Plorostalia capansis, uh, Pterocarpus capansis, and Ectomnus, uh, um, Ectomnus autumnalis. This one is mostly commonly used in, in a province called uh, KwaZulu Natal, mm. where apparently now base is mostly used by the Zulu people. If you have a bone defect or anything, then they will give you that. So we start combining these plants. We 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 make plants based scaffolding, and then we use the plants with um, cartilage chondrocyte cells, uh, muscular cells, and then we also use adipocytes stem cells. And we look at if these plants can differentiate stem cells into chondro into cartilage and into bone. Wow. Okay. That's really, really interesting. Yeah. So like what made you decide So, that you were also the, the next publication that I'm seeing here that I wanted to talk to you about was about the Pleristilia carpensis extracts. Um, what exactly made you decide to focus more on that specific extract and that specific plant um, for the rest of your research? So it's just like Alicia, when I was doing my, my master's, uh, when I, I first that introduction to my supervisor, I already have an idea of uh, plants yeah. because I did phytochemistry mostly on my own. And my mom is a traditional healer and get to see her using medicinal plants to treat people, make me want to, 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 to screen more on plants to see what make this plant active, what are the bioactive compounds that are present in this plant. That's so cool. during my master's, I was working on close to five plants. And then from those plants, uh, we, we do normal uh, screening that you do when you are working with plants. We do extraction, we screen them for phytochemicals. We, we look at which compound are present. We do antimicrobial, we do anti-inflammation, we do also toxicity. And we noticed that this Plorostalia campensis plant was the one that stand out from all the plants that I was working with. That's wow. when we take it further, then I can feather it up with my during my PhD. And in my PhD, I was taking the plants, introducing it to uh, adipocyte stem cells, which I isolate myself from mm. adipocyte tissue on on on, on porcine. You know, on the joint, there is smaller adipocytes there. So we oh, okay. isolate, we take the cell from there. And then that's when I, I check if these plants will be able now to 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 give the adipocytes ability to differentiate either into cartilage and into bone because that's where our, our research group focus on. And uh, the, we find that these plants basically can really differentiate stem cells but not into cartilage it was <laughs> when we do a, a 3d cells it's more like oh, you see you instead of say of, of culturing your cell in a monolayer we did it looking like a, a 3d we give it like a 3d kind like shape and we noticed that at the end of that uh, 3d layer cells we find that the cells were just like boom oh okay so wow we, when yeah, when we take it for uh, immunohistochemistry, when we do histology, uh, we, we find high level amount of both. And this was also confirmed on gene expression. So where we noticed that there is expression of collagen type 10 and then a little bit of collagen type 2. So this, uh, that work, what made me choose that plant also wow. was because from my master's and also on my PhD, it gave us a marvelous uh Result. Fascinating. I have to sidetrack just a quick because uh, you mentioning your mom is just so cool and the way she kind of like maybe had like a bit of a, you know, gave your idea a boost from the beginning where you were already um, um, have knowledge about the plant and all that things. Um, can you just quickly tell me a bit, is your mom um, still do practicing or is she still doing medicinal um, healing? Yes, she's still doing medicinal okay. healing. Uh, recently, I was just telling her, like, I went to start looking at, at cancer cells and see uh, what can you use when somebody has osphagus cancer. Oh, yeah. And then she was like, no, there is combination of plants that you can do. I say, no, you know what? I'll come sit down with you. And then oh, we have sure. the conversation because the main purpose is to make sure that the knowledge doesn't disappear when she passed on. So we keep the knowledge. And wow. I'm transferring the indigenous knowledge and putting it into science, modify and validate. Yeah, see, that's the wonderful thing because I feel like you're actually, yeah, that's exactly what you're doing. You're like validating 
like uh, things that have already been existing for years and years and have been passed on from generation to generation. And now you're actually just putting it into a more scientific form and telling people like, look, it's actually truth. There's truth to this. There is like real, you know, science locked behind it, giving us results that are motivating to keep on using this type of medicine that is natural and good for you and good for the environment, etc. <laughs> so that's wonderful. Yeah, so that's, cool. That's what I'm doing, Alicia. Your mom Thank must be so much. proud of you. <laughs> like you, you're yeah, kind of doing what she's doing, know, like, but just on a PhD uh, level. <laughs> yeah, she, she always, you know, she always says I'm a traditional healer, <laughs> but in the science field. Exactly. <laughs> because I remember during my PhD. We were able to get, there was some um, plants that they use for when a person has like, if you've got inflammation, then she'll say you can use it. Then I just uh, do extraction, uh, combine, do the formulation of the plants. Mm -hmm. And then we had, we were able to translate that research work into a commercial product. That's, so I was like, wow, wow. This, this is so fascinating. Yeah, It is fascinating. Wow. All right. Let me just see. I just want to quickly go into the next question that I had. Um, so you mentioned pleurostelia and um, you've talked about that quite significantly. So just in case some of the listeners have missed a few things, I just want to get back into some of the technical things um, about the manufacturing of the bandages that you uh, mentioned earlier. So you mentioned about uh, plant-based bandages that also incorporates the, the plants that you've mentioned earlier. Can you just tell me a bit more about like specifically how these bandages are um what they're used for, what you're trying to utilize um, when you're using the, when you're ma making these bandages, are they specifically for wound, uh, burn wounds, or just wounds in general? Okay, thank you, Alicia. Uh, this uh, because this this project is still underway, oh, yes. so I'm taking two different kind of plants. It's not only it's not Chlorostalia campensis. I'm using uh, the other plants is just the fruits that I'm using, and it goes through vigorous process. So there is a, a, a process that I, I I do when I'm doing extraction. So what's happened is this bandage. I don't want them to only be for bent wound only. It's also gonna be for any other kind of wound. So even okay. if you have a cut, then because I wanted. To look like uh elastoplast kind like vision but a plant base ah yes okay nice um so what type of polymer did you select for the manufacturing of this bandage uh, that can help incorporate the the plant uh as well uh, at this moment i'm using sodium alginate I'm using gelatin, I'm using pectin, oh, I'm using chitosine. So I'm I'm just using multiple and I'm doing the formulation I to see. see which one will work better as I compared to the other one. So, so you're going to go for that, like a then, experiment first on what's working the best and then choose and select from those. Yeah. I see. You've mentioned, yeah, I'm um, doing, I'm doing that. You've mentioned my favorite type of polymer, uh, chitosan, which is something I've been working with uh, throughout my honors, right through to my PhD, um, chitin and chitin derived, uh, you know, chitosan, as well as chitin nano whiskers and the, the whole shebang, all the, everything that has to do with chitin. <laughs> so I really, um, I really, I think that especially chitosan has a lot of interesting properties that people are now fully recognizing and um, you can see like the the publications that have to do with chitosan has like boomed in the last few 10 years, I think, um, because they can be used for like literally anything, I feel like they're, they're um, antibacterial, they have antimicrobial uh, activities, they have um, heavy metal adsorption capabilities, they... You know all the things. I I can't even. They they, they even can be used just to reinforce regular plastics. You know as fillers and so on. So it's just amazing. I think maybe hopefully they'll be the best uh, polymer for you in this project. But we'll see. You'll have to obviously do your due diligence and make sure that everything is like accounted for. But yeah, I'm I'm putting my money on Kaitosan. <laughs> Uh, in one of the projects, we are using them, uh, chitosin and sodium al alginate combination. And we have seen our scaffold morphologically internal characterization of it. It's so beautiful. It has a good pose and you know, it's beautiful. Like <laughs> it's beautiful. We are hoping on that uh, project, we're going to be able to patent also. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, my word. Yes. Y you were also mentioning patents, which is something I want to talk to you about later as well, because I know that's 
Ooh, that's a bit of a hard one to get through that process, right? I haven't done it myself, but I've spoken to a few people and I guess it's a bit of a tough uh, thing to, to get through at, until you get to the end and then you, you have a sigh of relief that you've managed to patent your work. Um, but I'll, I'll get to that later. I just quickly want to ask you another question regarding these bandages. Um, what, is the, what are the features that you need the bandages to um, have in order to have them be successful for the type of um, application that you want them to be used for? So in terms of wound healing, what do they need to have? What are the characteristics that you're looking for in, in this type of bandage? Uh, they need to be able to absorb moisture and leave uh, the good moisture for wound to heal. And they also need to be able to inhibit an infection that may okay because you know sometimes when you get to do you find that you got infection so they need to uh, to inhibit uh they need to have antibacterial activity mm. they also need to have anti-inflammation activity so the beauty part about this one they need to have skin regenerative uh, uh activity so they need to be able to regenerate the skin so they need to speed up the process of regenerating the speed, the, the 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 skin, and at the same time they need to be able to heal the wound, the, the the scars. We want a person to end up at the end of the day when they use the bandage, they don't have any scars left, mm. so they can have their skin as it usually used to. Remember, I'm from the tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. Yes. The main purpose is to make sure that you have the same uh, tissue as you used to. <laughs> To have before so it must have all that properties so there mm. is a lot of us is that we need we do to check that it's got all that properties from issue of molecular from issue of protein absorb uh, protein available in, in in the bandage that you need to have because we believe that from that those plants that we are using they have those properties that will assist the polymers and be able to have everything that we need exactly but oh, that's great we'll find out more after <laughs> maybe we Six months from now. Fair enough. Do lots of yeah, it's, it's a long <laughs> time. It's it's you need all that time to be able to uh, exclude all the 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 problems and the do the troubleshooting and so on. And I assume like it will also be great to have like additional, almost like bonus features where they're like more they're recyclable. They're you know obviously you know a bit more cheap or easy to um, you know come by in in the general you know when you when you're trying to like buy these products and so on so yeah the accessibility of it and so on but um do you also um let me just see there was this question oh do you also use electro spinning in in the cases of ma making these bandages or how do you make them uh, at the moment, I'm 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 doing uh, <laughs> trial and error I where see. I'm just doing them first <laughs> manually <laughs> to see because I don't want to move to big instruments until I'm sure the protocol is good and mm -hmm. then I can be able to do. But the only thing that I do use is uh, after I, I I I made them, I I I use normal microscope to see if there is no any bubbles formation in them yeah. or they're still okay or not. So I just do only my nothing. But I will do all this other thing after I have now get the right protocol. Great. Do you have any experience with using electro spinning or electro spinning machines of any sort? Uh, uh, in our lab, we don't have any. This is like a new kind of things of when we mm. are combining plants and we are combining polymers. But I'm collaborating with uh, one professor from uh, Rhodes University. Oh, I see. So okay. he, he got a 3D printing. He worked with polymers all oh, his yeah. life. I'm like, so I'm just, I just told him, like, let me first do the trial and error thing. So when I come to you, I already know this is which polymers we can combine. Co combine yeah. with plants and which one work better yeah. that will be interesting it would be great to talk to you again in like a few months after you've done all that and see how everything turned out because um it will be interesting to see how electro spinning compares to 3d printing because i feel like 3d printing is more controlled and electro spinning mm -hmm. has like the additional features that maybe 3d printing 
can't necessarily as of yet do, which is like the nanofibers, nanoscale um, type of fibers. Uh, so that would be very interesting to see how it turns out and how it works. But um, yeah, and you mentioned electron microscopy or just regular light microscopy. Do you uh, use that a lot for your characterization of your work uh, when you do studies like this? Uh, do you have a bit of experience on the electron microscope? Yeah, we do use electron microscope because we need to look at the internal morphology of it. So with mm. the with the bandage that I did, I just use uh, just to look at it. We so see that we got is a very smooth morphology of it because it's just uh, I want it not to be like a scaffold. You know, a scaffold is very hard. So yes. this one's supposed to be smooth. And then, yes, we do use electron microscope. And then we also do characterization looking at the spectra. Oh, yeah. uh, when we compare to the polymers so that we need to be sure that the polymers don't lose their activity I even see. when combined to the plant. So it's... So you use like the Fourier transform infrared um, spectroscopy to look at like the, the different peaks and see if the functional groups are still all there. I get it. Okay. And um, yeah, because like my work, I'm currently working in electron microscopy. So I had to ask that. I'm just so interested in <laughs> if any if electron microscopy is ever used in a project, I always love it. Um, and it's yeah. very, very common that people need that for characterization of their, um, you know, uh, product, products or polymers that they make or utilize. So I feel like that's when you want to see the porosity. And like you said, you mm -hmm. want to see the network and how they are you know, how they look like are actually <laughs> looking like yes. Um, yeah, it will be great to see how but they that's, turn that's out just like later. Just basically, Alicia, that's just like a new field for me, especially because I am from biochemist and uh, biology, cell biology. Now I'm oh, yeah. just busy doing this. Uh, I'm just observing uh, how material look like. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm becoming <laughs> yeah. more like a, a chemical engineering person. Yes, or a it sounds. Because I'm like, I'm combining material, but yes. I'm, I'm, I never ex I never thought I would find myself <laughs> combining material. So it's, it's fascinating. So funny, I that is another good yeah that's because, another good point because you're yeah. actually like becoming you you started out like fully more like tissue engineering biochemistry then you go into like a bit of the, the material science incorporating that and now you have to go all the way to chemical engineering because you have to physically analyze the materials that you're making and you know see the properties the tensile strength and everything has to be taken accounted for so that's amazing and that's one of the things why polymer science is so great Right. And why we have this podcast is because it just, I feel like polymer science is like this little spider web that just goes into all the fields and supports every research field. Um, the one thing that I wanted to also ask you is um, about the patents, which I mentioned earlier that I wanted to say, um, can you just tell me a little bit about the the process i know it's a bit of like a oh, schleppy process so you don't have to go into too much detail if you don't want to um but just tell me how what was that like to if it was that is is that your was that your experience was it like a, a you know struggle to get through the whole process or was it you know a better experience for you um how how was that experience to get your work patented uh for for us in our group it was not that much difficult because we uh, at our university we have technology transfer officers. So what happened basically was like we tell them about our work, and then they see that this work is very exceptional and is something new, and then they come and see that we are really doing the work, and then they assist on the issue of applying uh, for 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 the patent. So they uh, the university basically did the application for us, where we get both nationally and also European patent. So we've got like nationally and European patent. It was so easy. I didn't even know the process that is involved. The only thing I know is that they come to the lab and they were just observing me doing the research work, and then they were able. To, I I was able to write a a, a proper. Um, a, a proper report to indicate this is what I did, this is the SOP I used, and then they were able to use that on application for patents. So they've mm -hmm. got their own lawyer at the varsity, so it, they make it easy for us, That's especially fine. with the technology transfer office. But I think when you are, you want to do it individually, when you have a company, I think 
it can be a different story. You can either get a lawyer who's going to assist you on application mm. to avoid a lot of the whole process that come in, in, in contact when you're doing patent application. I see. All right. How long did the whole process take you about? It takes us for more than a year. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but still. <laughs> because I'll... we're able to get like um, uh, a letter after after a year so we started application i think 2017 and then 2018 that's when we got (laughs) a letter that yes we we have applied and we have filed the patent and then granted uh, i think and granted it also in in december i think december 2018 that's when we got the letter i almost want to say congratulations again because it is just such a good good work (laughs) what goes into protecting (laughs) these um the work in that time because it's quite a long time you know like what goes into like keeping that work safe uh so far i don't i i i i I believe like even if you have patent you have said you have said you have protect the work people can still go and to do and replicate your work yeah, true, the issue I is i believe like it's always all about what you did that nobody can go and uh, and repeat that, that whatever you did so mm. whatever you did that is the unique and some 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 of the thing i also believe in each of some of the things it depend on which hand is coming out from mm. so <laughs> you can have my my my, my procedure and then once you go and do the whole thing, even though you've got procedure, you end up not being able to 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 get the same data as I will get. That's true. Yeah, that is true. Some skill is necessary or some specific, you know, equipment or method. Yeah, that's very true. Oh, wow. Uh, can you just, I uh, think for some of the listeners that might not have um, he heard it in the beginning, what is the patent that you got through? What was the product that was patented? We patent, uh, it's called a uh, plant derived composition. So it's a formulation where I was combining uh, the plants to okay. make an anti inflammation gel. So we patent that, that, that plant derived composition. So that's the name of it. Okay. So, and it's yeah. a specific derived plant that was incorporated into that. Okay, nice. Um, yeah, well, the next thing I just want to talk to you just to like start um, like shutting down this episode and like getting to the end of it. So I don't want to keep you for too long, but I have to talk to you about your um, your active women empowerment for uh, you know women in science um, to like motivate and encourage women to start a career in science. That active movement that you're currently busy with. Um, can you just tell me a bit more about how you how you do that and what what you do like in your you know day to day or like when when you uh, are at events and so on like how do you incorporate that into your your work life okay i'm i, I do currently close to like uh, multiple things so uh, some of the things that i do to encourage i don't only encourage women i also encourage young girls who are still at high school so what i usually do is i mentor them and then I assist them on running their research projects. You know, uh, in South Africa, some of the schools, they have what you call, they give you a project you need to run, then you can do science expo. So I I have a student who usually, I, I, I like to, to work with females. So I have young females that I work with. So that's more like harnessing untapped talent. And most of the people I, I work with, when they do their science expo, because they are doing more into cell culture, into tissue culture, and then they become a winner of bronze, winner of um, silver medal. So uh, wow. I, I do that uh, most of the time. And then I also do uh, network. Op- I, I do support mentorship and networking for now. This is for women who are undergraduate. So usually I talk much more about the opportunity that is there when you are female and also when you are black and also when you are from the disadvantage. And mm. most of them, they look up to me. I was not even aware people look up to me <laughs> as their own mother until I started receiving a lot of messages, assist us with this. I am mm. receiving messages from LinkedIn where female will say, you know what, I don't know how to prepare my PowerPoint slide. Assist me. I get to assist and giving back to other female, it makes me feel like I am doing good. Uh-huh. I was not, and also the fact that I find myself being interviewed on my local radio station in my language. Yeah. 
most people at home, they always say, no, we want to be like you. You are the role model of our kids. And <laughs> that's wonderful. Overwhelming because I'm becoming an inspiration without me Aww. knowing. I, I <laughs> but that's the best. That. I love that. And you, you really and, have a very positive demeanor and like a go-getter spirit. And I, I do like, even when I'm talking to you, I'm like, I'm enjoying myself. Like you're just a great person to speak to. So yeah, no, definitely. I can see that. <laughs> and the other thing we do is I'm um, in part of uh, transformation leadership, which is one of the NPO within the, our community where these uh, graduates, while they're struggling to get a job, we assist on how to put their CV. We assist on how do you respond to interview question. And That's I right. get in and assist them on how do you now have a bossy boss, be able to be an assertive communicator. Right. So we assist them on talk, being able to communicate better. Mm. So yeah, those are some of the things that I, I do to motivate. And yeah. uh, during the time while I was doing my, my PhD, I even got a grant, small grant to host a, a female <laughs> science workshop oh. where we had uh we, we were able to 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 to, to gather uh undergraduate uh, masters phd and postdoctoral female and uh assist in issue of how do you communicate how do you network to each other and we started mentorship program among each other so yeah those That's are some of the I'm doing. do you have any uh future outreaches that are currently upcoming or do you know of any events that you are going to be attending that uh, we can put out there for any young female students that want to join? Uh, at the moment, it's almost end of the year. Ah, time, true. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's almost end of the year. The only thing I'm going to be to, to attend now is only uh, the science forum where I'm going to be there, but it's open for everyone who wants okay. to attend. It is it's happening in Pretoria. And All then right. that's what I'm, I'll be doing this this last week of December before I close for the ASOS. It's not much that is happening now, but mo most cases, if they want to know much about the upcoming event of females or when they want to apply for anything regarding to uh, South African women in science, like the L'Oreal, they should be able to follow like Department of Science and Innovation on LinkedIn, on all their social media. They should be able to follow like National Research Fund where they can get opportunity regarding funding available. They should follow UNESCO and OWID. Okay. <laughs> so then they get more information about women and more information about um opportunity that is available and the, recently i just submitted my application now where they were looking at falling walls female talent science mm -hmm. talent uh, these are some of the things you get to see when you ha you follow those kind of organizations you get to see those uh, those things coming up and then you get to be able to to apply but what i also do is when anything come out and it's regarding women, I always share on my status, I always share on my LinkedIn. That's I'll great. just only, I, I, the only thing I always do, I just repost whatever I got from the organization so people can great be able stuff. to see and they can yeah. be able to apply. So I'll definitely post your LinkedIn in the show notes so that they can follow you. And then I'll try and like throw in some of the other links, other links you mentioned as well so they can follow UNESCO, especially in L'Oreal. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there anything yeah. else that you would like the listeners to know before we close? Yeah, just to to to, to, to give them that most of those um uh opportunities that come, they are not limited. It's not only for South African opportunities, also opportunity where they cater for everyone, whether you are in everywhere. So mm -hmm. you, you get to see, like in the L'Oreal, uh, we they've got different national L'Oreal uh, opportunity available in the world. They've got uh, the L'Oreal National for South Africa, the Sub-Sahar for African. They've got the National for, I think, for China and for UK. And also, I think they have some in Europe. So this opportunity, they are there. You just need, if you follow L'Oreal uh, L'Oreal Foundation, you get to see when those opportunity come out. If you follow UNESCO, you get to see when this opportunity come out. Because this opportunity come out not only to to make you visible, at the same time they come up with grant that will assist you mm. to run your research, that's and wonderful. you can be able to reach the goal of your research. Yes. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much you, for Ali. your time. <laughs>
<laughs> it was nice uh, yeah, being it was with really you. Nice. And I really did enjoy it. At first, I was thinking uh, it's gonna be so difficult, but <laughs> I really did enjoy you. So you make the environment uh safe for me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank no, you I you really much. appreciate it. No, you were you were excellent, and the the answers yeah. you gave were very very thorough. And I think the listeners are gonna love it because they just love to hear about everything around the world as well. So it's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.